Good morning to each and every one of you, my brothers and sisters. Uh, today is August 9th, 2020. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church where our pastor is Dr. Reginald E. Backus. And we invite you here. We're glad that you're here with us this morning for our Sunday School Hour lesson. Uh, today's lesson is entitled, uh, Talk is Cheap, taken from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. And we'll be using the New King James Version. If by chance you're a member of Friendship Baptist Church and you have a regular Sunday school class, please call the church or reach out to your instructor and they'll get you the information. All of our classes are meeting either through conference call or Zoom platform. Uh, or if you're just a member of our church and do not have a class, we're so glad that you chose to tune in with us this morning. Also, those of you all that may not be a member or may not uh, or just may have found us on Facebook this morning, thank you for joining with us. And our prayer today is that God will do something or sh show something or reveal something through his word that will encourage you and strengthen you along your journey. Uh, we praise God for this opportunity to be here on behalf of our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, and of course on our past in the offices of this great church friendship. Uh, we're here at 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, and we're just excited about God's word. Again, the lesson this morning comes from James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity and the technology that you've made available to us to continue to meet, even during this COVID pandemic. Father, we ask that wherever uh, the hearers and listeners may be, that you may uh, empty out their minds and their hearts so that your word might fill them up. Help us to be lifted up higher, to see you clearer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Our lesson this morning again, James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27, and our key verse is, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Uh, this morning, our goal is to show, one, that wisdom is represented in our works and not only in our words. Two, that we learn how to sympathize and empathize with those who are most vulnerable and act on their behalf. And three, that we engage in a peer and an undefiled living and ministry in and around our lives. So this book, James, was written after the Christians were spread about following the death of Jesus Christ in the beginning of the early Christian church. Uh, James wrote this book uh, to encourage and instruct the children of Israel that had now become followers of Christ. And his instructions were simple, to stand firm in your faith. Now, the strong theme of trusting God, God, regardless of surrounding circumstances, is so relevant in the church today. In the midst of civil unrest, in the midst of this uh, veil being ripped, uh, ripped off of the, uh, the hurt and the pain caused by hundreds of years of systemic racism and uh, uh, oppression towards blacks and minorities in this country, in the midst of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's so easy to doubt and to worry and to let fear and anger consume us and dictate our actions, our mind, our thoughts, even our words. But the message that was preached and taught throughout this book of James is still so relevant to the church today. And that message is simple. Uh, regardless of surrounding circumstances, uh, uh, stand firm in God. Uh, the Sunday School book summarizes James as proclaiming that real faith produces authentic actions. Real faith uh, produces authentic actions, and we'll get into that authentic actions later, but we're talking about the desire, the motor, the motivation, the reason why we do the things that we do. Uh, uh, in other words, the why is just as important as the who, the where, and even the how much. A lot of times we look at the quality and the quantity of someone's production and work, and uh, it, it's more important the motivation behind it. It's the reason why you can hear the best singer in church not move anybody, but the person that can't find a, a right note can tear a whole church apart. It's because when you infuse your, your, your willingness, your ability, your, 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 your ableness with the Holy Spirit, God can move mountains, and you can be the most gifted, talented person in the world, and, and, and we can watch nothing be accomplished uh, because the absence of God. It's why Saul, the best fighter in Israel, was not able to def defeat the Philistine giant, but David, the smallest boy in the camp, slayed him with just a slingshot. And James encourages us throughout this text, throughout this book, specifically throughout these verses this morning, 19 through 27, in the first chapter, that no matter what's going on around you, let the reason that you serve God, let all the things that you do, the, the impetus for what you do, be the, to serve God and the Holy Spirit within you. Uh, in faith, uh, 
if, if, if faith were found on the career chart of life, uh, it would be in the lower levels. It would be the blue collar, the overtime, the hard hat, the dirty hand. It, w- it would be in that category. In other words, James is saying faith is not something to be lifted up and put on a pedestal. Faith is not something that we show off and we brag about, but faith is something that does the work, that makes the sacrifice, that regardless of what's going on around them, continues to stay on the road and confronts the challenges that lies both externally and internally because of the word of God that's in us. So we'll jump right into our lesson. Our lesson is broken down to three parts. It's not a long lesson this morning. First, avoid anger, verses 19 through 21. Be a doer of the word, verses 22 through 25, and the true religion, verses 26 through 27. Again, we're reading from the New King James Version. So the first part, avoid anger, is found in verses 19 uh, through 21. Uh, James chapter 1, New King James Version, it reads, So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls so when observing the circumstances of life life circumstances uh we we must remember to do two things the first thing is not become mad or upset with god it's so easy to look at what's happening around us what's happening to us what we don't have what we feel we should have, what others have, what we feel they should have, and start to question God's will and plan in our lives. Uh, I I have become overjoyed as I've listened to the testimonies over the last uh, few weeks of different preachers, different ministry groups start to share the benefits of COVID-19. Now, when when we are in the midst of a health crisis that has not been seen in a century, where over 150,000 people have lost their lives, where thousands of people are without jobs, without homes. How can we look at this situation and start seeing the benefit? And and that brings me to the second point. Instead of being upset with God, we have to seek God's will and purpose for whatever is going on. Now, I know that is a glass half full optimistic approach. And for those of us that have been personally infected or affected by this pandemic, sometimes we're not trying to hear the good news of a pandemic when a loved one has lost their life, when I can't pay my bills, when my utilities are being turned off. But it, the trick of the enemy is to convince us that what's going on around us is not for our good. And what I've come to learn in my life is no matter how uncomfortable, unpleasant, or unhappy we might be in the midst of bad timing, I have come to learn that after the rain, the sun must shine. Countless stories, countless examples, countless illustrations that we shared here at Friendship that I've shared throughout these lessons about how if we just keep pushing forward, uh, we would be able to uh, reach the goal that God has set for us, whether it's driving in the rain and keep on driving until it stops, whether it's waiting for a cake that's filled with uh, some good uh, ingredients, some not so tasteful, but when they all come together, it tastes perfect. But I think Paul said it best in Philippians chapter 3, I press towards the prize, the call of the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. What it, the prize of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus. What Paul is saying is that once I get my mind set up on the goal that I find in Christ, that goal is more important to me than whatever's going on around me. And my brothers and sisters, if we truly believe in what God has promised us, if we truly believe in the gift of salvation and eternal life that God has offered us, then we must learn to put on blinders and ignore the circumstances of life and come to trust in God. Because I've learned that even in the midst of this pandemic, even in the midst of sickness and death and poverty, and even in the midst of the social unrest of racism and oppression, I've come to learn that God has not given up on us yet. I never thought this country would ever come to a point where we would learn to bear bear the the atrocities that blacks have faced but now i for the first time i actually have hope i actually have hope that that racism might be improved before i die i actually have hope that 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 our white brothers and sisters might change the way they see me in the next few years And I believe it was the COVID pandemic that set us down and said, I'm going to take everything away where you got nothing to look at but the injustice 
but the murder, but the oppression, but the racism, but the murder of George Floyd. And perhaps it was a pandemic that made this country sit down and realize the atrocities taking place every day. And so I hate to go on this rant, but uh, James makes it clear that we must be willing to trust that whatever's going on around us, regardless of how extreme, uncomfortable, unpleasant it might be, God still has a plan for our life. And the same God that has kept the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace, the same boy, God that kept Daniel in the lion's den, the same God that supercharged that rock in Daniel's David slingshot, the same God that parted the, uh, the river and let the children of Israel cross on dry land, the same God that allowed our forefathers to escape from slavery, the same God that ushered and marched us through the civil rights movement is the same God that is here with us right now in the midst of the civil unrest, in the midst of this COVID-19 pandemic. And God has not brought us thus far to leave us where we are right now. Uh, we, we need to learn, like I said, to seek God's plan and purpose in all that we do. We need to find joy in learning from mistakes and challenges because it's in those mistakes and challenges that we find out who we are. I must admit that uh, as, as Christy and I, my wife, continue to learn each other and continue to grow together after about 14 months of marriage right now, it's in the challenges of marriage. It's in the, 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 the strains of life where our true character is developed, where I start to appreciate and develop a deeper love for her because I understand the true character, the true reasoning, the true thought process behind her actions. It's in those tight moments. It's in those uncomfortable conversations. It's in those squeezing moments where we learn that what we soaked up is what we're squeezing out. Now, James goes on and not only talked about uh, using the circumstances of life uh, as, a, as a way to discern God's plan for us, but he talks about how anger and, and, can, and can, can possibly control our life. Now, the Sunday School lesson says anger is produced by hurt, fear, and frustration. And so many times in life when we're either hurt, uh, afraid, or frustrated, we let anger come out and we let anger take, take control of our actions. But I would challenge each believer this morning to look not at how we react, look not how, at how others react, but look how God reacts to us when we find ourselves letting him down. Uh, God, uh, uh, one thing I've noticed about uh, uh, my father and my mother is uh, when I would make a mistake, when I would get in trouble, I'm not talking about silly stuff. I'm talking about serious mistakes. Before they got mad or upset, they would always ask me first, am I all right? And then two, they would come up with a plan to fix it. And sometimes their concern for me, their desire to make it right, was so compassionate, so believable, so heartwarming, so encouraging, so relieving to me, the wrongdoer, that I forgot I had done something wrong. And oftentimes, the punishment would not come about until the restoration had taken place first. And sometimes in my life, I look at how God responds to the mistakes that I make. And when I make mistakes, sometimes self-inflicted wounds, I watch God perform miracles in my life, guaranteeing my safety, my recovery. And then I fail to realize sometimes that I've done something wrong because God's compassion takes over and the consequences that I should get are overshadowed by the love and compassion, the forgiveness, the restoration that God shows towards me. In other, in other words, instead of getting the punishment I deserve, I get the grace that I'm not due. And I praise God today that all the mistakes I've made in my life, all the wrong rooms and doors I've walked into, all the wrong streets I've driven down, all the bad relationships I've had, all the bad decisions I've made, all the wrong words I've said, the horrible thoughts I thought, the wrong things I've done, the things I shouldn't have drank, shouldn't have smoked, that somehow God, instead of punishing me, instead of striking me down dead, he saw a way to recover me, to heal me, to forgive me, and put me back on the right tra track, on the right path instead of wiping me out like I deserve. And all of us, if we're living, if we're breathing, if you're listening, if you're blinking, if you have control of any of your limbs right now, it's not because you've been so good, but because God has been so graceful. 
And we cannot let anger dictate our actions. Why? Because no one has let down anyone more than we have let down God, yet he veils his anger from us and continues to provide and love and care for us. And so now when we look at the things that others have done to us, that others has done against us, we should be slow to anger. Why? Because God never lets his anger shine on us. Uh, we need to replace anger with the word of God. I look at how Jesus responded to everything when they tried to trap him, when they tried to trick him, when the devil tried to tempt him. Each and every time, whether trapped, tricked, or tempted, Jesus used the word of God as his way of escape. And my brothers and sisters, the way we fight off the enemy's trick to allow us to be consumed with anger because of the circumstances of life surrounding us, we use the word of God. Yea, uh, uh, we, 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 we know that uh, thy rod and thy staff, uh, they, they, they shall protect me. We know that God prepares a table before us. We know that our cup runneth over. If nothing else, just look to the 23rd Psalm. And then if you want to go a little further, look at the birds of the air and the grass of the field. If our God provides for them, certainly he will provide for us. Look at the children of Israel when they did not even have to save food because God let fresh manna rain down from heaven time and time again in the Bible, in our forefathers' history, and even in our lives. God has done amazing, miraculous things. And we need to learn to trust in God's word and not allow the anger of life's circumstances, the fear, the frustration, the hurt of life's circumstances to push us towards anger. So not only do we avoid anger in verses 19 through 21, but as we go down to verses 20 through 20, 22 to 25, we see that we must be a doer of the word. It says, therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Amen. So there's a disconnect that uh, James identifies here between hearing and doing. In other words, all of us can uh, testify that through our life we have learned that it is easier to hear than it is to do. I can't tell you when I look at children, uh, uh, Pastor Bacchus' his grandson, one of the funniest things I see him do, and sometimes it gets uh, frustrating, and I talk to myself, he's just two, two years old. But Jackson is one of the smartest young fellas I know. He will look you in your face, listen to what you say, sometimes repeat it, and then put the smile on his face and do the exact opposite of what he knows he's supposed to be doing. If that is not the illustration of how we as children of God respond to the word of God in our lives, I don't know what is. What happens is God looks us in our face. He speaks directly into our lives, not only through experience, not only through the Holy Spirit, but through the evidence, through examples that we've gone through, but most importantly, through his word. And he shows us exactly what we are to do. We read it, we shout over it, we sing it, we study it, we pray about it, we teach it, and then we get into our lives, we get into our day-to-day -day routines, and we do the exact opposite. It's like looking at the speed limit, watching it say 45 miles an hour, and you going 60. It's watching a cop drive past you, slowing down, and keep on speeding up. It's knowing you should not text on your phone, but texting anyway while you're driving. We know what to do, we know the consequences of if we do it wrong, yet we still do do what we want to do anyway. I have no idea why. I, every time I go to McDonald's, I know I need smaller portions, but for some reason, I get an extra chicken sandwich no matter what I get. Every time I go to the grocery store, I know I do not need pop, but I always get a 12-pack of Pepsi no matter what time I go. What I've learned is even though I know what's right, even though I know what I should do, even though I know what I've been instructed to do, I still do what I want to do anyway. Paul said it best, when I want to do right, evil is all around me. And we as children of God need to become doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Last week, Pastor Bacchus spoke about the problem with the church that some people says that the church is filled with hypocrites. And he's right. We are all hypocrites, but we do not need to be so hypocritical. In other words, when you go to the doctor's office, you go to get checked up and chances are you are sick and something needs to be fixed. However, you do not need to be as sick 
as you are. We can eat better. We can exercise more. We can sleep better to help our overall health. And the same thing goes with our living in Christ. We can do better. We can speak better. We can pray better. We can study better. We can uh, live the word of God better. And we do not have to be more as morally corrupt. We do not have to be as hypocritical when it comes to us convincing others that God's word is what's trustful in our lives. Uh, when I talk to a financial planner, I want to see some type of financial stability in their life. When I talk to a nutritionist, I want to see a physical re representation of health in their life. When I go to the dentist, I want to see good teeth. When I go uh, to the preaching house, I want to see a pastor that's encouraged. And my brothers and sisters, when we share the word of God with our friends and loved ones, not only through our testimony and through our evangelism, but through our living, they're looking to see someone that reflects the love of God that we claim to be inside of us. And my brothers and sisters, we need to be doers of the word, not just hearers. Uh, and I use this example so often, uh, Pastor Bacchus, at the funeral, uh, when his uh, mother passed away, he shared the example uh, that he talked to his family, a family full of preachers and Christian leaders throughout all uh, spheres, of, spheres of life. And he said that we preach and teach about this man named Jesus all the time. And now is the time for us to lean on him. And what better words that a Christian should encourage themselves on their daily walk as we go about living. That we preach and teach and we sing and pray and study and shout about the word of God. And we should not just be hearers but we need to be doers and lean on that word. Uh, James goes on to talk about a mirror. Uh, and he says, uh, what good is it to do? Uh, look in the mirror and then walk away as if you did not see what was there. Uh, and the same way we use mirrors to inspect our physical appearance, we should use mirrors to inspect our spiritual appearance. Uh, what I've learned is when I walk past a reflective surface, regardless if it's a mirror or something else, if I see something that's not right, I'm making an immediate adjustment, whether it's intentional or not. I've been walking through parking lots and looked at a window and saw my reflection and saw something on my face and stayed there until I got it right. I've been walking past and saw a reflection on a water fountain and saw that my shirt collar wasn't right. Looking right now and several times in the camera and the screen that's in front of me, I've made adjustments to my sweater and my screen. When I first started the video, I had to stop it and raise the camera. It's impossible to see something physically wrong and not look and make the adjustment. Well, my brothers and sisters, the problem is that we look at the word of God, we see something spiritual wrong, spiritually wrong, and instead of making the adjustment, we look away as if it wasn't there. The same way you would not look away if something was wrong with your face or with your clothing, how can we look at the word of God, see ourselves compared to it, see something wrong, and look away as if nothing is going on? We use the word of God as a mirror to inspect our spiritual status. And sometimes uh, uh, if something is wrong, we need to make the adjustment and not just run away. Too long in my life, I've known what I should do. I've known what was expected to me of me, and I've let it an impulse, a desire, a thought, a test message, an invitation, uh, a link, uh, a chat, a conversation, a flirt, a, 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 a free something, get me on the path for something I wouldn't do. And my brothers and sisters, what I've come to learn is that I can't let the opportunities of life distract me from doing right. Uh, one thing I've learned uh, through these videos here is uh, this morning I started Sunday school lesson and started recording about five minutes later than I wanted to. And the reason why is because I had to shave this morning at home. I didn't really need to shave, but I looked pretty bad. And I was thinking, uh, I need to put my best foot forward for God, not for the cameras, but uh, I know I, I, I could do better, so let me do better, even if it was going to take me a few minutes. Now, I let my physical appearance delay my intended star time because I looked and saw something wrong and said, even though I may not have enough time, I need to make it right. I wish I had that same type of energy and attitude towards my spiritual life to say I, it's worth missing out on something. It's worth uh, pushing, delaying something. It's worth being late because it's some things in my life I must get right. I can't read the word of God. I can't hear the choir sing a song. I can't hear the pastor preach a sermon. I can't hear the deacons pray a prayer. I can't hear the Sunday school teacher teach a lesson and sin be revealed in my life and I not hold my life up to that word and make an adjustment. It's almost impossible to get into your car after someone else and not fix your mirror because even the smallest adjustment needs to be made for clarity it's worth making. 
And my brothers and sister James makes it clear that when we hold our living up to the word of God, adjustments need to be made. So not only should we avoid anger found in verses 19 through 21, not only should we be doers of the word found in verses 22 through 25, but finally, as the last two verses of this first chapter of James, we are taught the simple truth of true religion. Again, reading James chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, the New King James Version, it says, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religious religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So James draws this connection between our tongue and our heart. He says that there, the tongue and what comes out of the tongue is a direct correlation of what lies in the heart of the believer. Uh, the tongue is an accurate interpretation of what's inside of each and every one of us. And I've come to learn that oftentimes, regardless of intent, regardless of who they thought, uh, one's true, uh, true uh, thoughts are revealed in what they say. Uh, just this week, earlier this week, and we, the news reel has been uh, rolling, but uh, the uh, AOC, the famous congresswoman from New York, first term freshman congresswoman, was walking through the hall, got into an engagement, uh, kind of loud, boisterous engagement with a Republican congressman. And as he walked off, he mumbled something under his tongue uh, in uh, disrespectful, vulgar language, disrespectful towards women specifically. It was heard by a media person. They talked about it. And then she, instead of running from it, she talked about his uh, awkward apology and how if that's how he feels, uh, he's just been hiding it forever. And the truth is, many people weren't able to defend him because once you say something, you must realize that it's out there. I shared the story in Bible class about uh, eight months ago. There was a, ki a kid from uh, uh, Stanford. Uh, he had just got accepted to Stanford University, great grades, perfect SAT scores, and somehow he had said some racist things on his social media page, Twitter, three years earlier. Uh, it was all publicized. Stanford rescinded his scholarship, then rescinded his acceptance, and now he has to go to a college not as the same elk of Stanford because of something he did at the age of 14, 15 years old. My brothers and sisters, what I've learned is that words can build or words can destroy, and we must be careful how we use our words. Too many of our black brothers and sisters of our uh, uh, minorities that have grown up in urban Chicago have stifled their growth because a teacher told them they couldn't, a teacher told them they wouldn't, that they can't apply, they will never be something, they can't be something. And what I've learned is that the only limits that we put on our own lives are limits that we self-impose. And oftentimes those self-imposed imposed limitations are birthed out of words that someone has shared to us. Uh, and let me be the first if no one has told you, you can be whatever you want to be. You can accomplish whatever you want to accomplish according to God's will in your life. But don't let the enemy suggest to you that you can't do something, you can't be something, because you will take those words and apply them towards your living, and you will stifle the plan that God has for you. Too many of us are missing out on what God wants for us, and I'm not preaching a prosperity message. I'm not talking about missing out on millions, but you might be missing out on the right job, the right husband, the right relationship, the right car, the right house, the right health, the right living, the right application, the right loan, the right uh, savings because someone told you you can't, you got the wrong zip code, you got the wrong name, you don't have the right school, you don't have the right experience. Let me be the first to tell you if you have not heard this before, what God has for you is for you and can't nobody stop it, can't nobody block it, can't nobody even explain it. That's the faith that we have as Christians, that in the midst of doubt, in the midst of uh, unsurmountable circumstances, insurmountable circumstances, that we can climb mountains, we can walk through valleys, that we can be protected from the enemy. Even in the fiery furnace, our God will stand with us if we simply have the mustard seed faith to believe what he can do. Uh, oftentimes, the closest people to us can do the most damage. I've had people that are far away say some horrible things to me. And I let it roll right off my back. But the people closest to me say one little thing, and I'll hold it closest forever. We are holding grudges. We are ending friendships. We are tearing families apart, tearing marriages apart, because we don't have the capacity to forgive. But, oh, my brothers and sisters, what if God had not forgiven us? Where would we be right now? 
But God so loved the world that he gave his son. And every bad word, every bad thought, every bad action is as if we're hammering the nail in Jesus' hands ourselves. Yet he still forgave us. Even the sinners, the, the men down there that had put him on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He wasn't just talking about those that hammered him to that cross. He wasn't just talking about the judge that found him guilty when he was innocent. He was not just talking about those that were gambling for his clothes at the foot of the cross. He was talking about you and me as well. For every time we sin, we know not what we do, and we're putting Jesus Christ on the cross ourselves, yet he forgives. So whatever someone has said to you, has done to you, has done to upset you, I don't care if it's a husband, a wife, a neighbor, a boss, a co-worker, a son, a daughter, now is the time to forgive. Why? Because we need someone to forgive us. And if by chance you think you're perfect, and there's no one down here to forgive you for that sin you're thinking in that thought, God has already forgiven you for that. One statement can ru ruin a life. A pastor, A.W. Staten of the Calvary Baptist Church in Chicago Heights, he always says that integrity is like virginity. Once you lose it, you can never get it back. Dr. Barbara Burtz, once considered one of the most respected uh, 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 people in medicine in this country, there's been a recent interview on CNN that all of her credibility is gone. Why? Because she sits there and does nothing while our president spews false facts that are possibly leading to the spread of the virus and the exponential growth of death because of this virus. A once respected colleague is not using her words as she should, and she's lost all sensibility of respect in the medical industry. My brothers and sisters, all it takes is one word to ruin someone's life. All it takes is one moment of silence. Martin Luther King said, in order for evil to prevail, good men need do nothing. You want to see racism continue? Be silent. You want to see systemic oppression continue? Be silent. You want to see our president continue to rip our country apart? Be silent. You want to see our community continue to tear itself apart? Be silent. The mother of the famous rapper that got killed Tuesday in Chicago's Gold Coast, she said, I don't want any retaliatory killing. I know what my son was a part of. I know what his friends can do, but just leave it alone. She's hurting. Her anger demands for justice, but her compassion and her love for God demands for grace. My brothers and sisters, we must show grace and mercy specifically in our language. And let me summarize this. Uh, David said it best, the 19th number of Psalms, 14th number, the 14th uh, stanza of the 14th verse of the 19th number of Psalms, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And then James, he clarifies it, if, in case you don't know how, how do you show this wisdom? How do you show this true religion? How do you show your, this love? By loving those who needs it most. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Love those who need it most and don't let the world stain you with its mess. And the only question as we end this lesson is who are those in your life? The one that hurts you the most probably needs the most love. Those guys standing on your corner, littering, selling drugs, game banging, they probably need you the most. That daughter who won't answer your phone call, that son who's strung out on drugs, they probably needs you the most. That husband that won't do right, that wife that won't act right, they probably need your love the most. Today is not the day to find reasons to be angry. Today is not the day to find reasons to be hurt or frustrated or fearful. Today is the day to find reasons to forgive, to find reasons to love, to find reasons to let our words dictate what we claim to be in our heart. And God says the reason that we do it matters. You don't sing because you're the best singer. You sing because you can't keep your mouth shut. God has been too good to you. You don't preach because it's Sunday morning. It's time to get up and preach. You preach because there's a testimony on your lips that God has been too good to you. You don't give because you know pastors watching the offering envelopes. You give because God has given so much to you and you don't deserve it. How dare you not give back to him? That's what this lesson is about. That's what true religion is about. God bless you, and thank you for your time. Let's bow our heads in prayer to Heavenly Father. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you for James' wonderful words. And no matter what's going on in our life, no matter what's going on around us, we are encouraged to stand firm in your word. 
to seek your plan, your purpose. Everything happens for a purpose. And we trust that everything we're going through right now, even in the midst of this rain, that sunshine will come out on the other side. But, Father, also help us to be doers of your word for the right reason. Why? Because you loved us and forgave us first, and we must reciprocate that same love to others. Bless this church, bless our pastor, bless each person that tuned in for this lesson. Continue to build us up as you would have us to be built. And if you see so fit to wake us up tomorrow or usher us through this day, help us to be better off than we were yesterday, today, and forevermore. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in. We praise God for each and every one of you. Praise God for you joining us here at Friendship Baptist Church. On behalf of our Sunday school superintendent, Sister Frederick Williams, our pastor, Dr. Reginald, uh, Backus, e, Reginald E. Backus, we praise God for each and every one of you. If you would like to support this ministry, you can give to this church uh, through the cash app, dollar sign, Friendship Chicago, through our website, fbcchicago.org, the giving tab in the top right corner. You can text the word give to 773-992-1462, or you can mail your check or money order to the church, 5200 West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois, 60644. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your prayers. And please tune in at 11 a.m. as our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, brings the word in a live record, a live uh, service sermon here from our sanctuary. God bless you, and may God keep each and every one of you.